right, hi and welcome to Red Reviews, a podcast where we talk about a variety of books from a Marxist and anarchist lens. And I'm joined by my co-host, Justin Clark. Thanks for joining me, Justin. Thanks, Corey. It's great to be here and hope you're doing well uh, also. Yep, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a couple of weeks. We're now get, finally getting back on the regular rotation, you know, so that's yep. good. Um, and, uh, I've have, you know, I sort of had a month off from the show. We had a month off from the show. So I've been doing a ton of reading in the interim. So, you know, I'm, I'm finishing up the last book of Rick Perlstein's history of the rise of the American right, Reagan land, which I've debated on whether or not we should do it on the show, but I'm like, well, we did Nixon land. Maybe if we do Reagan land, it's too much like overkill. I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe. Maybe if I end up like if I if I'm getting behind on things, I'll just throw it in the mix so that I have a book to cover so we right. can stay on schedule um, or we can talk about it. This is my segue. Or we can talk about it in the live stream we're going to be doing here in a couple. Weeks. Ah, yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> so we'll be doing a live stream tentatively. We're going to be doing a live stream on, on Wednesday, May 8th um, and on the Skeptical Leftist YouTube channel celebrating a thousand subscribers. Yeah, that's very right. finally. Congratulations, my friend. That's wonderful. Three years. To yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's that ten year overnight success, right? It, it, you know, yeah. it takes time, <laughs> but we we'll, we'll get there. We will yeah. get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's terrific. I'm so happy for you. I think that's fantastic, and uh, and yeah, and well deserved. Well deserved. You know, we are we are a small creator. But, uh, you know, creators, but we have a, a dedicated community who love what we do. And um, and so that's what we do it for, you know. Exactly. Here, smash that like button. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, some random geek. Ha happy to happy to see you here. For sure. All right. Yeah. Well, so tonight is part two of. Oh, we have another one. Yeah, uh, Velkin 999 is here as well. Hello, Velkin 999. Thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah, so tonight is part two of a series of two part uh, episodes talking about the rise and the um, and the consequences of the rise of the American national security state post World War II. Last time we talked about American Prometheus and the story of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the creation of the atomic bomb, and the development of the American national security state after World War II um, under President Truman and the ramifications of that, specifically like McCarthyism and the fact that Oppenheimer himself was probably the most high profile figure who was, who was a, who was a victim of, of McCarthyism when he lost his national security clearance right. um, in 1953, 54. Um, but tonight we're talking about Vietnam um, the Vietnam War. Uh, earlier this year, I rewatched um, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's excellent uh, documentary series, The Vietnam War, which came out a few years ago. And it really inspired me to go back and read a book that I've been wanting to read for a long time that we're going to cover tonight. And that book is The Best and the Brightest um, by David Halberstam. Um, David Halberstam was a very celebrated author, historian, investigative journalist. Um, he wrote on a variety of topics, including the Vietnam War. He also wrote about American foreign policy, like in the 1990s, post-Cold War. He's written about the media industry. Uh, he's also done a lot of sports. He's he wrote a book on Michael Jordan. Um, okay. And he also wrote a book on the Korean War, which was his last, I think, his last published book. Um, that came out um, after his untimely death in 2007. Um, he died in a car accident. Um, oh, geez. And actually on the way to interview someone for his next book. Oh, geez. And, um, but Halberstam was somebody who was a true American original. Um, his involvement with in covering the war, the American war in Vietnam, uh, started when he was a very young reporter in the 1960s. He went over to Vietnam for a time. Um, and he was with a lot of those really dogged early journalists who had gone over there, um, like him, um, Neil Sheehan, um, who was another important investigative reporter who was one of the guys who helped write the Pentagon Papers, which we'll talk a little bit about, um, write about the Pentagon Papers. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but Halberstam spent many, many years working on this book, interviewing people for the book, um, doing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, archival research to get a sense of what was going on with the war. Um, and then obviously taking advantage of the Pentagon Papers. So um, we'll talk about those in a sec. But but basically the book is, the book has an ironic title. So, right. which is its point, right? 
And the reason that like I this book is like my go to example. So one of the things you'll often hear, and I've heard this a lot in my own life from people, mostly liberals, who will say something along the lines of, well, if we just put the smart people in charge, everything will be fine. Right. Um, and we did that. And it created and and we did that. And that was called the Kennedy Johnson years. And we got a disastrous war in Vietnam that would lead to the deaths of 58,000 Americans and probably two to three million Vietnamese. Yeah. Um, and so I think this book is an abject lesson in that you should never trust someone being in power merely because they're smart. Right. Because all of the people who got us into Vietnam were very, very smart, capable people. They were literally the best and the brightest of their era. And so to set this up, you know, the Vietnam War was without a doubt, one of America's greatest sins. Um, I think that um, people will often describe it as like a quagmire and some of that's true. Sometimes people will say, like in the Ken Burns documentary, they'll say things like, well, they started the war with the best of intentions and it got kind of away from them. That's not really true. Like it's, it's right. you know, it was always a war about um, showing the, the global order who was boss. That right. post-World War II... Um, post the collapse of the uh, the British Empire, which had been the sort of world um, hegemonic power, you know, before the American state, um, the American government and the became the sort of policemen of the world. They were the ones who maintained the imperial um, structure of the world post World War II, and Vietnam was a outgrowth of that. And there were a lot of factors of how the American government got involved in Vietnam. Um, the actual ground war itself starts in 1965, but Americans are involved in Vietnam directly going all the way back to 1945. Um, but to give you some context, so before Vietnam became Vietnam, it was known as Indochina. And Indochina was a colony of the French. And, and so for about a hundred and about a hundred years or so, little more, a little less. It was a colony of France. Right. Um, and uh, because um, there are a lot of really good raw materials in Vietnam, specifically rubber. Um, rubber is one of their main like exports or was one of their main exports. And the colonial regime under in, that was led by the French was extremely brutal, very much like the, the British um, uh, colonizers in India um, or the American colonizers in the United States. Right. Um, and post World War II, you see this growth of um, the sort of decolonial struggle that a lot of these countries no longer want to be colonies of, of Europe. Um, they want to be their own independent nations. And so you see independent struggles in a variety of different countries all around the world. And one of them is Vietnam. And so starting in 1945, American involvement comes mostly in the form of money and weapons. Um, so the Truman administration um, was very active in promoting the French struggle. So the French's struggle to maintain its colony in Vietnam rather than sort of letting it become its own independent country. And the main reason for that was because the there was a very good shot that if it was going to become its own independent country and have its own national liberation struggle, that it would be under the com under communist rule. Um, and so the, the sort of the liberation fighters in Vietnam were known as the Viet Minh, um, and they were led by Ho Chi Minh, um, the, the revolutionary leader. Um, right. And what's interesting is with, with Ho Chi Minh, so Ho Chi Minh was, was somebody who was educated in France as a part of you know the, the fact that he was sort of a beneficiary of colonialism in that regard, that he sort of learned how the West worked and then used it against them, <laughs> um, which is kind of cool. Um, and in fact, he often referred to um, the the American involvement in Vietnam as a tragedy, and it's sad because you know this is the land of you know the Declaration of Independence. This is the land of Jefferson and Washington and Lincoln. Why would they do this to us? Like we are fighting our own a version of of independence. You, we would think you could see that, but right. they didn't because um, one. Um, they well, the United States was directly interested in maintaining a colonial uh, the colonial powers of the French colonial power in Vietnam, and two that if it were to fall, it would fall to communists, and that was not going to happen. 
Yeah. The book has a really good, Halberstam has a great section in his book talking about FDR and how FDR viewed um, Vietnam. And it's kind of a great, it's a great encapsulation of the big difference between FDR and Truman. Um, and we talked a little bit about that in the Oppenheimer episode, but we're going to get more specific here. So uh, Franklin Roosevelt, basically FDR, who died in April of 1945, um, and, and Truman, who is his vice president, becomes president. Um, FDR basically understood that this was a national liberation struggle, that if we went on the side of the French, we would lose um, because the colonial struggle's heart's really not in it. They don't have the resources or the or the, the, the political will to make it work. And uh, he basically knew that that was going to happen and that if it was going right. to fall to the communists, well, who really gives a shit? Like it was basically who cares? It's a little country. It's not a big deal. Like whatever. But there are a couple of things that really happened that sort of changed the American government's view of all of that. Um, one is the fact that uh, FDR died and Truman came to power. Truman was a much more hardline anti-communist than FDR was um, and much more of a hard, you know, sort of the architect of the Cold War. Right. But the second thing that happens is the Chinese um, revolution in 1949. There are a lot of American planners and a lot of American uh, military and intelligence officers who are in China who keep letting the American government know, oh, it's fine. It's fine. The national government will stay in power. We know what we're doing. Everything will be fine. And then it falls. Uh, you know, uh, China falls to the communists or, or, as, or as it's often described by American war planners as we lost China as if it's something that they could lose in the first place, it's not something that belonged to you, you know, <laughs> like, you know, but it's that hubris, right? It's that, that, that imperial yeah. hubris of like, well, this country was, was under the nationalist government of Chiang Kai-shek. We are, he's our guy. These are our people, you know, we're going to have our relationship with them. And then the communists finally win in China after a, you know, 35 year plus civil war between the nationalist government and the, um, the, Ch the Chinese communists, who at some points of that struggle would actually unite to fight the Japanese who were, who were trying to impose their own colonial rule on parts of, of China. Right. Um, so at one point, basically, the, the communists and the nationalists team up to fight against the Japanese, and that goes through most of World War II. When right. World War II ends... Japan is out of China, so then it goes back to these two fighting, and the, China, and the communists win. And with a country like China, not only its size, not just in sheer miles or, or the geographical size of China, but also the population size, right? I mean, China is a two billion people country today. I think it was like right. something along those lines back then, you know, 800 million or a billion people back then. Yeah. So, uh, that leads all of to the basically the early 19. Uh, oh, let me let me back up real quick. So basically, with Truman, they they supply Americans supply the French with weapons. They supply them with money. They supply them with resources in the form of sometimes military advisors. So there mm -hmm. were, and they're called advisors. Like it, it's they're military officers coming to Vietnam to train the French in how to fight. Right. And the French get their asses kicked. I mean, basically for a number of years, I mean, up until the 1950s, the, the, the French basically lose um, and they leave. And from there, a settlement is made, very similar to in Korea, where the, the country is basically partitioned off into two. North, with the capital in Hanoi, is communist. And south, the capital in Saigon, is, you know, pro-Western. We won't call it democratic because it never was, um, you know. Essentially, South Vietnam until it was um, until it was uh, um, taken over by the communists in 1975 was essentially ruled either by a military junta or a familial dictatorship, depending on you know. But they were all friendly in in South Vietnam. They were all friendly to the United States, so we didn't give a shit whether or not they were democratic or not because they were our people. Um, and so this cuts us all the way to. 1960s. Um, this gets us to right. th the main period that we know. Um, and before we get into that, um, do we have any comments from our from our viewers? Uh, yeah, uh, Velkin 999 said, "Of course, uh, of course, the president with the good take dies." Yeah, 
That's usually it. <laughs> and ultimately, what's interesting, like, and he didn't even have to be like a pro communist to get to that position. It was basically like, it's a small country. It's not much strategic importance to us. You know, we're better off just kind of letting that, let the chips fall as they may, and we build the world that we want to afterwards. Right. And that was how, that's how FDR felt about a lot of it. He was much more amenable to Stalin than Truman was. He was much more amenable to this sort of post World War II decolonial order, right? Right. Because at the end of the day, FDR very much believed in sort of the, as much as a liberal president could do, right? You know, yeah, he believed yeah. in some form of decolonial, um, decolonialization that, that these countries had to lose, that these, uh, that France and, and, and England had to lose their empires in right. order to be a part of the new order. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really sad, but, uh, that's the nature of the, of, of American politics. You never know what might happen. Uh, some random geek said earlier in regards to, uh, the smart people running things. Uh, yes, the Nick Land br approach, the world would run fine if Steve, Steve Jobs just runs the world. Right, right. Um, um, I'm going to plead ignorance. I don't know who Nick Land is, but, uh, but, um, Obviously, that's incorrect, though. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that is incorrect. Like, you know, first off, um, Steve Jobs didn't know when to have um, actual science-based medicine take care of the pancreatic cancer that yeah. killed him um, yeah. when he was doing, like, fucking coffee enemas and bullshit. Like, instead of, you know, he had a very treatable form of pancreatic cancer and he didn't go into surgery early enough. And, like, this is all in the Walter Isaacson book. I read it, you know, a few years ago. Like you can read about yeah. this, and it's just like he was into all that alternative health bullshit. Apparently, Steve Jobs stank all yeah, the time. Yeah, he didn't believe in showering. It he was, was like, like he was gross thing. all yeah. the time. Um, <laughs> it, but anyway, yeah, yeah. That's and uh, over on over on Instagram, I can't bring it up on the screen, but uh, Street Rat Punk said came in late. Which book are we covering? So, oh sure, that. um, for for we're covering the book, um. The Best and the Brightest um, by by journalist um, David Halberstam, and it's a book about how the United States got involved in the Viet in, in Vietnam um, in the 1960s, um, and that takes us basically to 1960. Um, 1960, John F. Kennedy narrowly wins the presidential election in 1960, defeating Richard Nixon, um, and. It's a sort of new era in Washington. Um, people were happy that they had this young you know, apparently, you know, intellectual president who um, was going to bring all these young, new, fresh people in who were going to make the world a better place. And this is kind of the the, the story that we get, right? Camelot, you know, the myth of, of the Kennedy years. Right. And what you learn from this book is how much um, that's, some of that's not really true, that, that like ultimately that's more of a myth that sort of came out of his assassination um, in 1963 more than it did anything else. And so what Kennedy does is he acknowledges right away that essentially he wants to be his own. He's kind of his own secretary of state. Mm -hmm. um, and so he puts these really like dynamic people in a bunch of different, very specific positions like national security advisor. He puts a guy named G McGeorge Bundy in who's a character that like the first big first part of the book is about him and about he and his brother, William, uh, Mc, William Bundy and the Bundy brothers and how, you know, they were very much involved in the development of the Vietnam war and were kind of very, um, bullish about it and wanted to do it. And obviously at secretary of defense was Robert McNamara, which if anybody knows anything about the era, that's a name that's probably very familiar to you. Um, again, this was somebody who came, um, out of the Ford Motor Company. He was the president of Ford before he became Secretary of Defense. And the reason that he was picked was he was bringing all of these sort of quantitative analytical tools to war. And Kennedy believed that in the future, wars would be fought in these very quantitative analytical ways rather than these sort of qualitative historical ways. And um, McNamara was kind of the right guy for the job for that. We'll get into what that meant for the war in a bit. Um, but at Secretary of State, he picks Dean Rusk. And, and Dean Rusk was somebody who people saw as basically a non-entity, but he really wasn't. I mean, he um, he serves all eight years of Kennedy Johnson as Secretary okay. of, of State. He's one of the longest serving Secretary of States in American history. Um, and, uh, you know, he was he was one of the, the two major officers responsible for the sort of the partition of Korea after the Korean War in 1953. Oh, okay. um, and 
and so he's somebody who plays a very low role in the early Kennedy years, um, but does have some, I think, specific things in which he is very involved in, like you know um, the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and so on. Um, and he's one of the few people who early on has more reticence about getting involved in Vietnam, um, but doesn't really show that. And then by the time you get into Lyndon Johnson years, he's basically in lockstep with where the Johnson administration goes. Mm -hmm. So Kennedy, um, and so, you know, through the Truman and Eisenhower years, which go from like 1945 to 1961, that sort of 15 year period, the United States is actively supporting the French uh, colonial government in Vietnam. The French colonial Vietnam government in Vietnam gets its ass kicked. They put, they, they throw their tail between their legs and they go home. The country is then partitioned and through the Eisenhower and early Kennedy era, there is still that support of sort of diplomatic support and material support and military support in the form of military advisors. So Mm -hmm. as early as the 1950s, Americans are sending from 1940s to 1950s, America is already, the United States is already sending military advisors to train the French. And then once the French leave, they start to train the South Vietnamese. Right. Um, and in the 1950s and into the 1960s, South Vietnam is under the government of essentially a dictator known as, uh, whose name is No Dim Diem or Diem. Um, and Diem was um, a Catholic, which is very interesting for the region of the world. Um, so a lot of Vietnamese Catholic converts were Catholic because of the colonial influence of the French. Most people right. in Vietnam, they're not, they're sort of their, their, their more um, indigenous religious beliefs were more like Buddhism. Most people were uh. Buddhist, um, but he was Catholic, which often put him at odds with the Buddhists who were um, some of them in positions of sort of conscience and authority and who would sort of fight back. Um uh, in their own way. We'll get into that in a sec. But uh, so the DM government and then his brother, um, uh, whose name is New, uh, his brother and his brother's wife are kind of running this sort of family based sort of dictatorial cabal. And okay. they have like they try to have elections and whatever. But but, you know, it's the typical autocratic bullshit where like. ZM like bans, like he tries to shut down opposition candidates and he's, they try to shut down polling places. They try to stop certain people from voting. So right from the get go, the South Vietnamese government is extremely autocratic and corrupt, very, very corrupt. Um, and but basically only functions because the United States supports it. Um, otherwise South Vietnam would have fallen to the communists much, much earlier than 1975, if the United States had never gotten involved. Um, and around the same time, um, in North Vietnam, you have the leaders like Ho Chi Minh, who is kind of like the Lenin figure of Vietnam. He's sort of the right. theoretician um, and the sort of national sort of liberatory figure. But the guy, by the time you get into the 1960s, who actually has more influence on a lot of these things is Lei Zuan, who is like his direct number two. And okay. you can think of Lei Zuan as kind of like the Stalin of Vietnam. He's, <laughs> he's, he's a lot less forgiving and a lot more autocratic than Ho Chi Minh. Right. Um, and over time, Ho Chi Minh becomes more of a ceremonial figure and Zuan sort of solidifies power. Uh-huh. Um, and then you have Ziem in the south, and then you have Ziap in the north, and he's like the main military general for the north, and he's really, really good. We can think of him as like the Trotsky figure. And so throughout the early 1960s, the Kennedy approach was to kind of keep the status quo, that we were um, that we were going to continue to send military advisors. And over his th- two, three years as president, um, as Arthur Schlesinger called it, his thousand days, um, you see the escalation of military officers and advisors in Vietnam. Right. And right away, you get a sense that it's not working. Um, and they knew that. I mean, they knew that it, as early as 1962, you know, 63, they knew it wasn't working. Right. right. But the reason that Kennedy stuck to it was because he, he was in a position, and this is kind of the limitations of like the American empire and why the empire – 
is bad for democracy in the sense that he had to sort of stay the course on Vietnam because if he didn't, it would make him look soft on communism. And this is a country, the United States, that had just gone through the McCarthy era, that had just gone through China becoming communist, that had just seen in 1959, you have Cuba goes communist. In 1961, you have the failed Bay of Pigs invasion led by the CIA, where CIA officers and military personnel basically invade Cuba to try to do a coup, throw Castro out, and they get their asses whipped, like, unreservedly. Then you have Kennedy's meeting with Khrushchev in the summer of 61, where basically Khrushchev makes him look like he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, and then you get into the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, where the Soviet Union sends nuclear weapons to Cuba um, and basically aims them right at the United States. Because, I mean, think about it. Cuba is, is literally only like 45, 50 miles yeah, away. It's from right Florida. there. It's right <laughs> there, right? And part of the reason that they did it was because the United States had nuclear weapons in Turkey that were aimed directly at the Soviet yeah, Union. That's right. So there. There, <laughs> and so um, there are a lot of different people involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, including obviously the President Kennedy, his brother, Robert Kennedy, who was Attorney General, Rusk as Secretary of State, who sort of worked with the Soviet diplomats to sort of de-escalate tensions. And there was a deal that was made where um, the United States would pull its missiles out of Turkey and the Soviets would pull their missiles out of Cuba. The one condition that Kennedy had was that Khrushchev not go public about Turkey, that we were pulling the missiles out of Turkey because he didn't, because right, that right. was going to make Kennedy look bad in the eyes of, you know, war hungry Republicans in Congress and the war hungry Democrats in Congress, the more conservative Democrats. Um, and yeah. so Kennedy, his whole approach to Vietnam is happening within the context of all of these things. And, and some of them are failures of his own making. And so what we see kind of right away is um, that uh, we, that, that essentially the military advisor plan is not working. That, but the public doesn't know any of this. Um, the, the Kennedy administration and this is especially the case during the Johnson years, um, basically keeps the American public in the dark about Vietnam. Right. Doesn't tell them what's going on. Doesn't, you know, and so a lot of times the public statements that are made by American military and civilian officials are wildly at odds with what's actually going on. And so you have a lot of, uh, and, and one of the things we talked about in the previous episode is about how in the American empire, if you challenge the base assumptions of it, you will be punished. And if you right. don't and you celebrate its assumptions, you will be rewarded for it. This happens again and again in Vietnam, where a lot of military and, and intelligence officials, um, some in the CIA, um, let the American government know, like, this is not working. Like, like we are not going to be able to win. Uh, we cannot train the South Vietnamese people. They, they, are, they, are, they cannot be trained as good soldiers. Um, they, the government is immensely corrupt. We cannot work with them. Like this is, this cannot succeed. We're on the wrong side because the National Liberation um, Army, the NLA, which the Americans always called the Viet Cong, but that's not what they called themselves. The, the Vietnamese, right. North Vietnamese communists called themselves the NLA. Um, they were really good. They were really, really good. Um, scary good uh, at, at, at fighting colonial powers trying to maintain their colonial their colonial yeah, posts in Vietnam. So they would they mean it was it was guerrilla warfare. Um, you also had the development of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was this essentially this large underground tunnel system that went in through most of Vietnam into parts of Cambodia and Laos that would supply military weapons and materiel and supplies and soldiers to wherever they needed to go in the country. Um, and Americans were not ready for this. The American government had never fought a war like this. Right. Most of the time with American conflicts, you know, it's like World War II, where the Nazis, they all are dressed like Nazis. We know what they look like. We can fight them. It's very traditional, right? Like they're on one side, we're on the other, and we're fighting each other, right? The Vietnam War was not like that. Right. Um, it was guerrilla warfare. It was very strategic. The Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, um, under Ho Chi Minh and Le Zuan were very, very good at doing a lot with very little. 
Mm. And and it just made the Americans look like complete fucking morons. Um, it was kind of remarkable. And you have this sort of returning motif from security officials and intelligence officers basically saying, maybe we're on the wrong side here. That like, you know, the South Vietnamese yeah. government is immensely corrupt. It's it's brutal to its own people. You know, there were student uprisings in South Vietnam that were brutally repressed by the South Vietnamese government. You had the Buddhists who were protesting the 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 horrific actions of the South Vietnamese government against its own citizens, leading, of course, to the famous photograph of the Buddhist monk setting himself on fire to protest right. um, the the South Vietnamese government's horrendous corruption and, and oppression of its own people. That maybe there were some Americans who were like, you know, North might be communist, but maybe they're the right side. That that at the, at the very least we should get on the winning team. Right. But that would be challenging a base assumption. Of, course. of the American yeah. empire. And you cannot do that. Yeah. And so that assumption, if you challenge that assumption, you were punished. And so there's, there's multiple accounts in the book of military officers, intelligence officers who are being skeptical or being critical of the war or the being cri critical of the American involvement and they lose their posts. They get ostracized. They get, they get put on some other shitty foreign desk. They don't want like, it's all kinds of stuff. But those who were saying the right things, the things that they wanted to hear, were, yeah. were, were, um, they were rewarded for it. And that really gets us to a critical moment, which is that, you know, in the fall of 1963, we're into almost into the, to the fourth year of the Kennedy administration. Um, there are some, some real murmurings within the Kennedy White House that maybe we should pull out of Vietnam. We should kind of, we should scale this back. And so you do see some scaling back of the military advisors that Kennedy was much more of a realist and, and kind of recognized maybe this won't work and that, um, but I can't pull out all the way because if I do, it's going to make me look bad and we're going into an election year. Right. So I need to keep the American public in the dark as much as possible because it's going to make my administration look bad because despite being all of these really smart people, we keep fucking up and, and we keep, we keep losing essentially. Yeah. This all changes on November 22nd, 1963, um, when John F. Kennedy is killed in Dallas and Lyndon Johnson becomes the 36th president of the United States. Right. Lyndon Johnson, uh, former U.S. senator, former Senate majority leader, the, the, you know, the big, hulking, imposing, intimidating, cajoling um, Texan, you know, he's a very different person than Kennedy. Um, he's somebody who comes to politics through the New Deal. You know, he starts working in a congressional office in the early 1930s, wins a congressional op wins a con seat in the House in his own right in the 1930s, becomes a U.S. senator, one of the most effective majority leaders in American history, very, very good at politics. But he has one major limitation. He really doesn't know anything about foreign policy. He's really good about domestic politics and all of his instincts about domestic politics, whether it's the, like the great society, anti-poverty programs right. or civil rights. He's, his instincts on all those pitch perfect. He's the president of the times. He does the right thing on Vietnam. He doesn't. Part of it is because of the people around him who don't, who do not want to challenge the base assumptions of the war. And that's where you get all these people like. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, um, the Major Military General in Vietnam, William Westmoreland, um, and all of these folks. Um, later on, Walt Rostow, um, who was who would take over as National Security Advisor after McGeorge Bundy left. Um, and a lot of figures who were in the Kennedy years stayed with Johnson. So Dean Rusk was there through all of Kennedy and all of, of Lyndon Johnson. Robert McNamara was there for almost all of the Kennedy Johnson years. Um, McGeorge Bundy was there for a long time. These were guys who wanted a continuity of government. And so, you know, at a very harrowing time in American history, a president had just been killed. Um, there was a sense in which the Johnson people and the Kennedy people made it work. But there was always an antagonism because the Kennedy people fundamentally, a lot of the Kennedy people fundamentally did not respect Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson didn't particularly like them because he, what they, you know, because he sort of, they thought of themselves as sort of these, you know, effete New England intellectuals who know better than everybody. So there's always that tension there. 
Right. But a lot of them, you know, so the people who are the, 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 the officials who sort of become casualties of that leave and those who sort of fit to, to work within the Johnson uh, White House stay. And so you see a lot of that. Um, and the war basically escalates under him. It becomes a war. You know, prior to 1964, 1965, American involvement in Vietnam was minimal. You know, it was you know, 10 to 20,000 military advisors. We sent money, we sent weapons, but it was fairly large scale. We were trying to do war on the cheap. And that pretty much ends with the Johnson era. Um, and, and uh, but before we get into that, let's stop for a moment to have uh, review some comments. Sure. Uh, yeah, we got uh, Bemke watches Buffy uh, has been pretty active in the chat. Thank you. Very oh, much. great. Thank um, you. So earlier they said uh, <clears throat> keeping people in the dark makes it easier to write the narrative after the fact. Yes, it does. Although that gets kind of upset with Vietnam because of the Pentagon Papers. We'll get into that. <laughs> right. Um, also, a huge portion of Americans didn't want to be doing what they were doing. Uh even some of the jingoistic demographic that wasn't drafted. Yes, this is absolutely right. Um, and especially, and that's especially case towards the end of the war, where you have American military officials or you know, you know, non-commissioned officers. A lot of these guys are drafted. Like they're, you know, they don't want to be there. So, like by the time you get into like 68, 69, 70, 71, morale is at an all-time low. And in fact. There are mutinies, like where, like um, where, um, where some of the sort of uh, lower military officials would kill, like their their officer or their lead, you know, their the commanding right. officer, because he wanted them to do some crazy shit. And they said, "No, we're not going to do it. So we'll just kill you." Yeah. Uh, which which that happened. It happened less rather than more, but it but it did happen. But it did happen. A mm -hmm. um, couple more. Um, to be fair, it can be a good thing to not know anything about foreign affairs, given the right mentality. Yes, and, that's absolutely uh, right. Related, that, but that wasn't the case in Johnson's case because presumably the deep state. Some of that's true. Yes. So Johnson leaned heavily. And that's a great – do we have any other comments? That That's it for now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your great comments because that's a segue into talking about that uh, and nice. about the Johnson period. <laughs> so um, yes. So he's someone who leans – who leaned heavily on the officials in the White House. He leaned heavily on Dean Rusk. He leaned heavily on Robert McNamara. In fact, he sort of saw Robert McNamara as the best person that he could have ever had in his White House ever. Like he held mm -hmm. him in such great esteem because Robert McNamara was a man who came of, a, you know, he sort of came to prominence as the head of the Ford Motor Company, and he sort of turned Ford around as a corporation um, during some of its sluggish years in the 1950s. And before that, he was somebody who was planning um, some of the uh, Air Force, well, pre-Air Force, but like the 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 um, air raids in World War II. So he was, he was an officer in World War II who helped plan out a lot of the aerial assaults by the U.S. government. He was quite effective at it. Um, so, you know, Robert McNamara comes into the Kennedy White House with a certain glow about him. People thought of him as like, if there's anybody who can turn around the Department of Defense and the Pentagon, right. it's, it's Robert McNamara. And in some respects, that's true. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you see military spending go up, you see, you know, advancements in weaponry, technology. Um, some of that was good. Some of that was bad. Um, uh, one particular piece of technology that he was very bullish about was the M16 rifle. Um, and, uh, there's another really great book about Vietnam by, um, Corporal John Musgrave. It's his memoir of serving in Vietnam. And he talks about how the, the M16 was a piece of shit. Right. Um, so it was mostly like, it was really a, a piece of garbage. It wasn't very good. Um, and it would get jammed a lot. And so there's a very good shot that if it jammed that you were going to get shot by, you know, some, you know, VC guy who's going to get you because your, your gun would jam up or it would clog up or it would get dirty. You had to constantly clean it because it would get dirty very easily and it would work very well. But McNamara loved the M16, even though like basic facts were that it wasn't very good for those kinds of like deep trench warfare kind of conditions. It was much, a much, it was a much more uh, it was a, it's a rifle that was much more suited to like, um, like helicopter raids or like sniper option, like sniper, um, 
like sniper operatives and things like that. It wasn't something that you would give like your grunt, Um, but they did it anyway. And part of that was because the United States had a very big military contract with the company that made them Um, getting back into the whole notions of empire. But but yeah, the M16 was a piece of shit. It didn't really matter. And that was kind of the, that was a microcosm of the problems with Vietnam. So what was the big sort of inciting incident that gets us into Vietnam? Well, that in, in a big way, in terms of the war, in terms of like direct troops on the ground, um, and that is the Gulf of Tonkin incident, which happens in August of 1964. Um, very much like the Bush's weapons of mass destruction, um, the Gulf of Tonkin event or the, Dolph- the Gulf of Tonkin incident was largely fabricated um, by American mm. war planners. Um, essentially, they were they said, oh, this, this Vietnamese ship shot on us. So we have to shoot back at them and blah, blah, blah. It was a provocation. Right. There's no really clear evidence that that was actually the case. Um, and even as early as, as when Halberstam wrote this book, which was in 1970, 1971, people knew that like the, the evidence wasn't very good on that, that that was actually right. the case. So the Vietnam War in a lot of ways was much like the war in Iraq was kind of started on a lie um, that, uh, and it was a lie that happened three months before the 1964 presidential election. <laughs> um, Lyndon Johnson in his first two years in the White House, or the first year that he's in the White House from November of 63 to November of 64, he tries to keep Vietnam under wraps. He's like, I, you know, we're going to continue to send military advisors. We're going to continue to provide weapons and, and, and aid to South Vietnam. We're going to continue the Kennedy playbook, only more so, and kind of go in all in on it. And, and, um, but keeping the public in the dark about it, like we're not going to say too much because if we say too much and it looks like maybe we're not as successful as we should be, um, then the public will turn on me and they'll vote for Barry Goldwater, which if you know the story of Barry Goldwater and how conservative he was and, and quite frankly, what was a, at the time a liberal era, I mean, Barry Goldwater has snowball's chance in hell of becoming president. I mean, I, I mean, but, but Johnson didn't trust that. So right. his whole thing was like, I have to show a certain level of strength. And the Gulf of Tonkin incident, um, which is very muddy and essentially didn't really happen the way that the U.S. government said it did, um, led to what was called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, um, which uh, was this resolution resolution passed out of both houses of Congress that authorized the president, i.e. Johnson, to fight the Vietnam War however he felt like it. So instead of a formal declaration of war, which is what we had done in every previous you know, major military conflict in the United States, they gave Lyndon Johnson a blank check to fight a war, literally and figuratively, in the sense that a lot of the military, a lot of the budget had been sort of black booked for years, where these like keep this off the books, right? Be, be, you know, and which would lead to inflation in the country, and like eventually in '68 he'd have to pass like an extra tax in order to pay for the war. Um, but a lot of times they try to do, they try to do the war small and they try to do the war on the cheap. And that wouldn't work because the, 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 the National Liberation Army in North Vietnam were committed to their independence struggle, struggle. And, uh, and they were going to win regardless because there was no way that the United States was able, was ever going to be able to do it to, effectively short of literally nuclear weaponing the entire country, like nuclear bombing or just bombing the entire country. Like the only way the United States could win was by killing everybody who lived in right. Vietnam. And there was yeah. no way they could do that. That wasn't palatable to the public. Not so much that we care about the loss of human life and the fact that it's a genocide or whatever, but like, no, the American public wouldn't go for that. Right. Yeah. And you have to, the other thing you have to think about with Vietnam is it's the first war that's fought on television. It's the first major war that people are seeing it on television. And this changes a lot. So nowadays with American government, um, the war coverage is extremely sanitized. Very, very sanitized. There's very little that you see. Vietnam was like like that. There wasn't that level of of scrutiny. You know, Um, it was a lot more open. So you had really interesting investigative journalists, people like David Halberstam, Neil Sheehan, Michael Herr, um, uh, and others who were reporting about how awful the, the South Vietnamese government was, how corrupt it was, that yeah. we couldn't really provide democracy here merely by giving them weapons. The South Vietnamese army was incapable of fighting the North, that the North were just far too effective at fighting on their own turf, that the American soldier was not equipped to fight in this long 
protracted war in a region of the world where some days it would be 100 degrees and it'd be yeah. in 100 percent humid humidity where literally you know your you would get you know you would get um what they call jungle rot like on your feet on parts of your body some of your private areas like it was really hard to fight that war if you weren't there if yeah. you weren't if you weren't born in the land like the vietnamese were there's no way. And then fundamentally, the American war planners misunderstood the Vietnam War. They saw it as being a war against communism. And they saw communism as a monolith, right? which was dumb even in 1964. I mean, people, yeah. even people like George Kennan, who was one of the main architects of domino theory and containment, the idea that if, well, if we let one country fall, a bunch of other ones will fall and so on. He was even questioning whether that was true because right. the Soviet Union and China were already going to be at, at odds. And history would play all this out because as soon as North Vietnam, North Vietnam conquered the South in 1975, the Chinese invaded and then the, the Vietnamese and the Chinese fought a war for 10 years. Right. So Americans were in, involved in Vietnam for 10 years and then the Chinese come in. So it really isn't until the end of the 1980s that Vietnam has their own country. Right. It's kind of crazy. They basically fight for 40 years. That's to crazy. Gain their independence. Yeah. It's a, and that's the true nature of what it was. It was a national liberation struggle. And you and and you cannot win that if the people believe in the message. Yeah. And the South Vietnamese never did. They never really believed that they were fighting on the right side. And so Americans would constantly have to butt heads with reality, which is that they couldn't win the war. That we kept, and so there were a couple of things that American war planners did that were disastrous. One were the bombings. So there was tons and tons of bombing, uh, just just bombing the countryside, bombing anywhere, um, to try to to put pressure on the country, and it never worked. It never really worked. The North Vietnamese were extremely ad adaptable to whatever the Americans threw them, and yeah. and despite the horrific loss of life. And by the way, a lot of the people that the American government killed were South Vietnamese. Um, the other book that I read about the Vietnam War recently is Nick Terse's excellent book, Kill Anything That Moves, oh, which right. documents all of the horrific war crimes of Vietnam that happened, including the, the My Lai Massacre in 1968, where right. American servicemen um, uh, led by um, Lieutenant William Cowley killed about 300 civilians, South Vietnamese civilians, men, women, children, infants. Yeah. No one, no one, no one was court-martialed for it, other than a couple of officers, and no one ever served any prison time for it except for William Calley. And Calley's sentence was commuted by President Nixon, so he was a free man within within months. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and Calley was a psychopath. I mean, truly a psychopath. So we were fighting this war where we're, we're trying to prop up the South Vietnamese, while, South Vietnamese, while at the same time we're killing civilians, we're destroying their homes, we're 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 fucking with them because. Because of one of the key metrics that the war was fought on, and this gets into Robert McNamara and his planning for the war. Um, but before we get into that, do we have comments? Yeah, uh, Bemke Watches Buffy uh, asked, uh, how do you feel about Michael Parenti's view on JFK slash Johnson? Um, I think I probably have to read a little bit more on it um, to, to give you a good opinion. Um uh, if it's similar to Chomsky's view, and it may be, I'm not sure. Um, what I can tell you is that um, I know that, that that they have a much more critical view of the Kennedy Johnson years than than most people do. Um, I think that you could really look at people. I mean, you can make the argument that people like John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson were criminals that that they were committing atrocities under the name of the presidency yeah. and. So, but no, I'd have to look more into that to give you a better answer. Fair. And then uh, also, can you divulge where most of your info comes from overall? I'm loving this. Oh, absolutely. So um, uh, this is the book we're covering tonight. It's called The Best and the Brightest by David Halberstam. Um, in terms of uh, Nick Terse's book, Kill Anything That Moves, is excellent. Um, uh, if you want a Vietnam memoir that I've read, uh, The Education of C Corporal John Musgrave, excellent book. Musgrave was a guy who spent a year in Vietnam, almost died, um, and uh, he was in he was in I think Quan Tin was where he was fighting, and he becomes a major player in Vietnam veterans against the war, um, and becomes an anti-war activist. Uh, 
um, and and uh, sticks up for soldiers who were vehemently against the war by the time they came home, um, because American soldiers were treated pretty badly by the American public. Right. Um, and some of that, I think, was justified in the sense that, like, a lot of American military officers did horrific shit, horrific shit in right. Vietnam, and they weren't heroes. But a lot of those guys, you know, they, you know, the vast majority of those guys were just fighting a war. And the blame didn't get placed on the presidents that deserved it. Bingo. That's right. There was this weird time where instead of the blame being put on the planners of the war, people blame the soldiers. And it's like, right. I know, like, I know it's easy to say, well, they were doing what they're told. But it's like, if you're, I mean, the average age, and I think this comes from like Nick Terse's book, the average age of an American Vietnam soldier, an American soldier in Vietnam was 19. Right. They were literally drafted and forced. They were drafted. To war, right? A lot like, of them were drafted. So starting in 1965, they have the military draft and the major military operations start in 1965. Um, and so the Gulf of Tonkin resolution happens and Johnson's given the authority to do the war. And then in 65, major ground troops are put on because the bombing's not working. They mm -hmm. sort of thought that if they would do enough of the bombing, that then the North Vietnamese would sort of be scared and be willing to get to the negotiating table to stop the escalations of the conflict. And they could sort of end the Vietnam War similar to how they ended the Korean War, which was a ending of the hostilities and the secured sovereignty of South Vietnam and North Vietnam. That was kind of originally the plan, um, but that was never going to work uh, because, again, it was a national liberation struggle. The Vietnamese were committed to it. The North yeah. Vietnamese were. Yeah. Any other comments? Uh, yeah, uh, Bemke watches Buffy just said, yeah, very weird to blame the soldiers considering there was a draft. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, a lot yeah. of people, there, there are stories of soldiers who would come home into the airports and they would expect like a warm welcome and they would get spat on, their cars would get, would get, um, blocked by protesters. They would get assaulted. There's, yeah. there's tons of these stories. Um, it's horrific. Um, and, and again, that's one of the things I think people don't often think about. They often think of the, the victims of empire, right? That who, who, who is victimized by empire? Obviously, it was the Vietnamese people, without a doubt. I mean, millions of people died in the Vietnam War right, um, right. through horrific crimes, whether it's bombing, whether it was napalm, Agent Orange, um, you know, uh, the, the horrific massacres that happened of civilians, so on and so forth. But a lot of the victims of the wars are also the people who fight them. Yep. It's the it's the average soldier. You know, a lot of them who were drafted or people who were enlistment, they enlisted because they thought they were doing the right thing, which is John Musgrave's story. He always wanted to be a Marine. His father was a Marine in World War II. He wanted to be a Marine. He wanted to serve his country. He wanted to be the, he wanted to do the right thing. And he gets over there and he realizes, oh, this is a shit show. Like, this is not great. <laughs> and and recognizes it for the what it is, which is all bullshit and, and fights against the war when he comes back home. Uh, a couple more, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bemke watches Buffy says, we are literally blaming 17 and 8 year olds for signing contracts to sign their life away with student loans. So, of course, they blame 19 year olds who were drafted. Yes, yes, <laughs> they did. A lot of the Vietnam anti-war movement, and it's not all of it, the Vietnam anti-war movement, which starts almost as soon as American involvement in Vietnam gets going, especially 1964, 1965, you, you start seeing some of the early protests and the sit-ins on college campuses and discussions of the war. Um, but a lot of the, the anti-Vietnam war protesters a lot of them didn't do this kind of shit. Most of them understood, but there were some that did. And the American public who were largely in support of the war for many of the, for many years, it really doesn't until basically 1968 is really when the public start to turn on the war. Um, but so for many years, Americans support it, but, um, but yeah, it, it is, it's awful to blame. Ki they're kids. They're basically kids. Yeah. And uh sapient. You, demonia. <laughs> Sorry, it's 2.30 here, so I'm off to bed, but I wanted to say I really appreciate – hi, I really appreciate the conversations and reviews between you two. So. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And feel free to um, you know, you know, watch the rest on a replay later. Um, Corey will provide an edited version somewhere down the line, but you can always watch the live stream version um, <laughs> if you would like to finish it up. And, and feel yeah. free to you know, leave us a comment if you have any other questions or anything like that. For sure. Um, but yeah, any other comments? Uh, that is it for now. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh,
Yeah, I think this one's going to run a little long, so I'll try my best to, to be concise. Um, but basically, so the U, one of the ways that, um, that the war in Vietnam was different, that, that it kind of led itself to a lot of the problems of the killing of civilians, the, the indiscriminate bombing, things like that was most wars are fought for really one reason, and that's to gain territory. You know, mm -hmm. usually when you fight a battle, right, it's you fight a battle to gain territory. And if you gain enough territory, then it gives you the strength to then negotiate for peace. Right. That's how most wars are fought. Right. The Vietnam War was not like that for some reason. Um, and part of that goes to Robert McNamara. So remember I talked earlier about how like he, he, he was really good at quantifying information. He was obsessed with that. He was trying to do war by algorithm. Um, people would often refer to him as like a human computer. Um, he was really good at like remembering numbers and calculating numbers on the fly and whatever. But what, the major way that the Vietnam War is measured, the success is measured, is not by territory gained, but by body count. And so the Vietnam War becomes mostly about how can we juice up the body count. And this is how you get a lot of the civilian killings. This is how you get a lot of the bombing raids. This is how you get a lot of it. Um, because you could kill a couple civilians, throw an AK-47 on them and say, hey, they're Viet Cong and move on. Who's going to argue with you? Right. You know, and the war planners were thrilled because then they could say, well, look how many people we killed. And the goal with the body count was get was to get to a negative replacement rate. Basically that we would be killing enough Viet North Vietnamese that they couldn't then replace. And that never happened. We never got to a place where the American military was killing enough of the Vietnamese that they could not be replaced. Right. And, and so the North Vietnamese were very, very good at getting, you know, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 more soldiers to do all this. And this is when Johnson realizes that um, the war is not going to work the way they were doing it. That, the, the, that, um, that if we keep doing the bombing raids, they're not going to work. If we're going to keep, but, but, but the thing is, is the American military planners knew it wasn't working. This is the crazy part. They knew it wasn't working. And then they would still go out to the, in front of the public and lie to them because they were so afraid of being honest. They were yeah. so afraid of being honest about the war that instead of saying, hey, this isn't working, um, uh, they would go out in front. Um, the late, great Daniel Ellsberg, um, who was the, was the RAND Corporation employee who leaked the Pentagon Papers, um, which were the secret military – in – the later part of the Vietnam War, when Robert McNamara was still Secretary of War, he commissioned a study be done by the Rand Corporation, which is the think tank in the U.S., um, a study on the origins of the American involvement in Vietnam and basically the American military involvement in Vietnam. This became known as the Pentagon Papers. Once Daniel Ellsberg, who was a, uh, an official at the Rand Corporation who had served in Vietnam as well, was reading these documents as, and developing these documents as a part of um, his job duties, he recognized that the, that the, the officials of, the, of Vietnam, Robert McNamara, Dean Russ, McGeorge Bundy, Walt Rostow, William S. Moreland, Lyndon Johnson, were all lying to the public mm -hmm. that we were not successful in Vietnam, that we were not getting to, uh, we were not going to be able to defeat the North, that we were not going to be able to get a settlement that the South Vietnamese government was corrupt and could never really work. And Dan Ellsberg has this story about when he was in Vietnam, he was on a plane with Robert McNamara and he's, and, and Ellsberg was one of the more honest people. He was one of the more people who would, who would go to um, Robert McNamara and say, look, this is not working. Like we, the, we, right. our policies are not, are not working. And McNamara would be like, thank you for being honest with me. Like this is, I need this information. It's going to help me change up. So like, Robert McNamara knows it's not working, but that very same day he goes out to a press conference and says, we are, we are succeeding beyond expectations. Everything is going really, really well. We expect the war to be done anytime soon, blah, 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 blah. And they keep doing this for years. I mean, years and years and years of the American government lying to the public about this war. A lot of the distrust and cynicism that people feel about American government starts with Vietnam. Um, you know, pre Vietnam war, most Americans trusted their government. They believed their government was doing the right thing, that they had their best interest in heart. Right. Um, and um, mind you, 
when I say they, I mean like it, this is this is a they that doesn't necessarily include black people or Native Americans or right. you know, or or um, uh, women or or minorities of any sort. Like I'm talking about mostly the sort of white middle class establishment who vote. The, that's what I'm talking about when I say they. Yeah. Um, but they believed in that, and there was sort of a consensus that like this was the right way to go, and uh, that starts to fall apart with Vietnam. People recognize that. We can't win this war. It's a one unwinnable war that no matter how much we gain, we will never gain in the long run. So one of the insanities of Vietnam was the policies about um, territory. So because body count was the number that mattered more than anything else, um, there were there would be times where they would fight battles on hills. You know, uh, Hill, I think it was like Hill 875 or one that became known as Hamburger Hill because people were basically turn into hamburger. Um, there's these stories of these guys who would fight their asses off, these American soldiers fighting against, you know, the, 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 the North Vietnamese, um, the guerrilla fighters of the National Liberation Army and the North Vietnamese Army, the NVA. Um, and, you know, they fight some of their, you know, some of their, 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 their company buddies would die. It was horrific. And they would take the hill. And then the American government would just say, torch it and leave it. So instead, in, in, the, in years past, in other wars, you would maintain the hill, you'd keep it. And if you had enough of those, you would maintain territory. So there was these cycles where they would go to a hill, they'd fight a battle, they'd have people die, they would torch it, and then they'd leave. And then six months, a year later, they come back to the same fucking hill. They do the same fucking battle, then set it on fire again and leave. And this went on and on and on for years. Sounds like Wait. bad strategy. <laughs> it sounds like terrible strategy. And it sounds like strategy put together by a fucking nerd, which is what McNamara was. You know, he was somebody who genuinely believed that if you could just calculate all these things on a spreadsheet, that you could win the war. Right. That's the big problem with a lot of these guys, whether it's McGeorge Bundy or, or McNamara, that they were so arrogant. They, they sort of thought that they knew because well, we're Americans, damn it. Like we're, you know, we were educated at the most elite schools. We were the heads of some of the most prominent organizations, you know, like, like Dean Rusk ran the Ford Foundation, the philanthropic organization before he became secretary of state. And right. McNamara worked at the Ford Motor Company. You know, there's all these, you know, there's, there's all, all these guys. None of this actually of qualifies government. you to strategize about war. About but. war. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. And you can make the argument that like, well, it's good to have civilians in positions of, of military decision making because, you know, you always don't want the military men in there. Yeah. You don't want the war hawks all the time, but. And, you know, and like William Westmoreland, who was the main commander in Vietnam for most of the Johnson era, like he was a graduate of West Point, like, you know, uh, it's like all these guys were people who they were, they were successful, immensely successful in their fields, their respective fields. And you would think that all this kind of collective knowledge and wisdom would lead to a better conclusion. And it just didn't. Yeah. And that's part of the, I think the American national security state has a momentum of its own that um, is set by the needs of empire, the needs of capital to perpetuate a system of oppression whereby nations that seek independence and seek their own path, and sometimes yeah. that means socialism, uh, that that doesn't get to happen, that we actually set the rules, yeah. that it's us who get to decide. And what we learned in Vietnam is that it doesn't always work that way. And in the long run, it doesn't. And if you look at the history of military conflicts since World War II, America has gotten its ass kicked multiple times. You know, basically we fought to a draw in Korea. We lost in Vietnam. We, you know, if by lost, I mean, you know, defeat the communists, which, you know, the Vietnamese won as much as we lost, if that makes right. sense. Um, and then, of course, like you have, you know, other than like, us like fighting back against Grenada in the early eighties under Reagan, which is like a small Island country. Like that we, we like to push around with our American military to l act like we feel so big and strong. Kind of like what Thatcher did with the Falkland islands around the same time. Yeah. It's um, all like the, like you say, like it's all about like the, the perpetuation of the empire and global capital and like, yeah. Making sure that nobody can push back against that sort of thing. Yes, and to maintain a certain hierarchy of elites, because that's really the thing about the best and the brightest, right? These people are the elite. Right. 
These are people who went to the best schools. These people had the best jobs. These are the people who had the best training. These people are supposed to be the smartest people in the room. And a lot of them were. Some of them were the smart, the smartest people in the room. Sure. And they, and they lost either way because, again, it doesn't matter how, how many bombs you have, how many soldiers you have. If you're fundamentally on the wrong side of the conflict, you will lose. And the Americans were. Yeah. And so, you know, to start kind of wrapping up, I mean, what is the aftermath of all of this? Well, McNamara eventually leaves government. Um, he goes to head the World Bank. Um, essentially, he's fired by Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson trusted him and believed in him and thought that he was the right guy, the most capable guy. And, you know, after three to four years of just constant American failures in Vietnam, uh, Johnson negotiates for McNamara to become the head of the World Bank um, and pushes him out of government. And then McGeorge Bundy eventually leaves. He's replaced by Walt Rostow. Um, Dean Rusk stays for the, for the long haul. Wes Moreland eventually is replaced. Um, I think the guy who replaces him, his name is Creighton Abrams, but that happens more under Nixon. And, um, and so, and Lyndon Johnson himself doesn't run for re-election. Mm. Um, he, he gives a speech at the end of 1968 where he says, I shall not, you know, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nominee, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. And, and which was a surprise. His advisors didn't know it was going to be part of the speech. Right. And the reason he did it was because he wanted to open up the negotiating table with the North Vietnamese. He really, he was, he, 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 he called a bombing halt of North Vietnam in March of 1968. Um, and this is also after the, the, the Tet Offensive. And the Tet Offensive is a major military operation of the war. Tet is the Vietnamese New Year. And this, and American military planners sort of thought during the um, Vietnamese New Year that the, the, the sort of the North and the South, they sort of, they lay down their hostilities and they have a period of peace. And the North Vietnamese were like, fuck that. We're going to take advantage of this. And so the North Vietnamese start major bombardments of multiple major cities in the South. And the American military force, to its credit, fights them back. And the Americans kind of win in the Tet Offensive. But the problem is, is that the American public sees what's going on in the war. And even though we may have won the battle we're losing the war, not just mm -hmm. strategically, but in the morale and the hearts and minds of the American public. The, 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 the Tet Offensive is, is sort of what happens, you know, and Walter Cronkite, the sort of revered broadcaster who was the head of CP, who was the host of the anchor of CBS Evening News, he gives, at the time, was very rare, an editorial where he basically says, this war is a stalemate. We are not going to win. Yeah. And so... Uh, so Lyndon Johnson, of course, doesn't run for election. Richard Nixon becomes president in 1969. The bombings continue to escalate. There is speculation that during the 1968 election um, that uh, Richard Nixon hired people to sort of scuttle the peace talks between the American government and the North Vietnamese government, um, violating the Logan Act. You can make an argument that Richard Nixon committed treason during the 1968 so like what he did in Watergate looks like a tea party compared to that because, right. you know, tea, yeah. um, and the war eventually do, uh, formal military operations in Vietnam end in 1973. Um, there are three things that kind of happen all at once. Richard Nixon wins reelection. He has his inauguration in 1973. He calls for the formal end of the Vietnam War and Lyndon Johnson dies. Mm. Um, they all happen within like a week in January of 1973. So American war in Vietnam officially ends in 1973. We keep some military people there, mostly intelligence operatives um, at the U.S. Um, consulate in Saigon in the South. And two years later, uh, in 1975, the North Vietnamese invade the South and they win. Um, and the country becomes unified under communism, um, basically making the last 30 years of American involvement pointless. And what, and the big thing that also happens around this time, which also makes the Vietnam War pointless, mm -hmm. is that Nixon starts formal negotiations with opening and normalizing relations with China. Yeah. He goes to China in 1972. He meets Mao. And his national security advisor, um, Henry Kissinger, starts formal diplomatic connections with China. Um, and, and so 
making the Vietnam War completely pointless because if the whole thing is like we're against communism, we're trying to fight communism, well, now you're negotiating with the world's largest communist country. Right. Um, you know, and so, you know, so 58,000 Americans died in Vietnam. Two to three million Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Laos died because it, we, under Nixon, bombing raids happened not just in North Vietnam, but they also happened in Laos and Cambodia. He right. started bombing, illegally bombing Laos and Cambodia, even after Congress cut off funding for the Vietnam War. Right. Um, and, um, and so we didn't win. Um, we normalized trade relations with, with Vietnam, I think, or normalized relations with Vietnam, I think, in the 1990s, and now they're a trading partner. Um, you know, it's very much like China where we, we, the cold war is over. The Soviet union is gone. Like the, it's, there's no real, like, so our relations with Vietnam are, are normalized, um, essentially. Um, it's still a communist government to this day. Um, although very much like China, it's sort of liberalized economically, right. um, uh, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, but yeah, I, I think the Vietnam war, as I mentioned earlier, was a tragedy. I mean, it was a tragedy for the Vietnamese, of course, first and foremost. It was a tragedy for the American military officers who were there, those yeah. who lost their lives or died, those who lost limbs, lost their, you know, who became uh, PTSD, those who had severe disabilities or problems. And, you know, because in our country, like we talk about how much we love our troops, but we treat our veterans like shit. Yep. And, um, and I think that Halberstam's book is a real play-by-play. -play. I'm only really scratching the surface here. There's so many other people that we haven't talked about right. and players who are involved with all of this. Um, but those are the major players. And I think that the, the big lesson for me out of all of this is that sometimes the empire doesn't win, that sometimes that, that, that empires are not permanent. And I think that... The Vietnam War was in a lot of ways the beginning of the end of the sort of America's unchallenged hegemony in the world. Right. And it was certainly the war and the major historical moment that changed American, the American people's relationship with their government. And we've become a country that is now more cynical, um, more untrustworthy, um, and uh, less amenable to um, what the American war planners want to do. And we've seen not just, you know, so we were there for 30 years or 30, almost 30 years. And in two years, the, the North Vietnamese win and they take the country over, which makes everything we did pointless. Yeah. Same thing happens in Afghanistan. We, we start the war in Afghanistan in 2001. We leave in the spring of 2021 and the Taliban comes right back into power. Yeah. Iraq. We, we invade Iraq over lies of weapons of mass destruction in 2003. We end formal um, conflict there in like 2013, 2014 under Obama. Um, and the country still racked with problems and sectarianism and inter, you know, intersectarian conflict. Yeah. Um, you know, America often leaves places far worse than when they found them. And, um, and there's this very telling thing that Lyndon Johnson often said which is that if I could just get Ho Chi Minh in a room and I could talk to him man to man and tell him what I want to do, which is I want to build dams, I want to build schools, I want to build homes, I want to do all these things for your people, that maybe it would speak some sense into him. And Lyndon Johnson was a, was a very transactional politician. You know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. You support my dam initiative, I'll support your bridge initiative, whatever. Right. And he did a lot of good for a lot of people. You know, the, in America, you know, civil rights, voting rights, Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, Secondary Education Act, like on domestic policy, Lyndon Johnson's one of the greatest presidents in American history in terms of improving the, the American people's lives. And it means everyone, not just like white people, but black people, right. women, like, you know, but Vietnam is undermined all of it. It yeah. undermined his great society, Yeah. Um, you know, and his very... In his very Texas uncouth language, you know, he once said, he's like, you know, I had, I had the love of my life, the great society, and I left it all for that whore Vietnam. That was the way he would describe it, you know. And there's a lot of that where it's like, you yeah. know, it's a little pissant country. It's a little shit ass country. Who cares about it? Whatever. It's a lot of racist language. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, 
Yeah. I mean, William Westmoreland, um, and this is in the Nick Terse book, well, William Westmoreland, who was the lead commander in Vietnam, basically said, oh, well, you know, because he was talking about like the loss of life and whatever and casualties and whatever. And he goes, well, the Vietnamese just don't value life the way that we do. You know, they that don't put a high familiar. You know, like they don't really put a priority on it the way that we do. Yeah, so there's a lot of racism like, too. Yeah. You know, Americans didn't really give a shit. I mean, most American soldiers didn't give a shit about the Vietnamese. They didn't care. Most military planners didn't give a shit about it either. Americans just saw it nothing more as another piece of the imperial chessboard instead of seeing it for what it was, which is a country made of very com uh, of real people yeah. with real desires and needs that have conflicting visions about what the future was going to be. Yeah. And – at the end of the day, I think that Halberstam's book, along with other books, shows how a colossal waste of fucking time and resources it all was. Yeah. And I often think, what would the country be like today if Lyndon Johnson recognized the folly that it was and it was and said, we're not doing any of this shit? Yeah. You know, we may continue to give them some aid, but if Saigon falls, fuck it. Who cares? Right. And yeah. if he had taken that attitude, maybe the world would be a different place. Yeah. You know, I think it might be a better place, but who knows? Um, so, yeah, so that's the best and the brightest. Um, uh, I think it's a masterful book. Um, I think it's one of the, one of the, probably the greatest pieces of like political journalism I've ever read. Um, and it's, I think, the go to example to give people if they say, well, if you just get the smart folks in charge, everything will be fine because it's not. Right. You know, no amount of intelligence makes up for the lack of wisdom. Yeah, there was a right. lot of intelligence in the room with Vietnam, but not a ton of wisdom. Yeah, I guess before we get going, I'll uh, we'll bring up a couple of comments. Uh, sure. Nine 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 said, "My wife's grandpa was one of the people tasked with spreading Agent Orange. He takes pride in what he did, despite it being the thing killing him. I think the pride is to justify his actions." Yeah, I think it's true. I think a lot of American veterans of Vietnam. Um, because remember they weren't, they weren't led into like the veterans of foreign wars for many years. Like they were even spurned by, you know, uh, veterans of previous wars. A lot of those guys kind of tell those stories to themselves to make them feel better about the fact that what they were doing was kind of pointless. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Vel Velkin 999 also said they killed so many people for nothing. Yes. It was pretty much for nothing. Yeah. 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 Um, Bemke watches Buffy said, here we go. Uh, yeah, they're pushing their civilization back decades. Everywhere we go, then we point at it as primitive. Exactly. There's a ton of that. There's a lot of racism that goes into racism, bigotry, dehumanization that goes into Vietnam. Yeah. Um, military officers would often use um, horrific slurs to describe the Vietnamese yeah. as a way of dehumanizing them. That, uh, it seems like everywhere that... Uh, there's an uh, like a dominating force. They always seem to use that dehumanizing language. I've, I've been just noticing this like everywhere now. It's yeah, Palestine. It's Rwanda. It's fucking every case yeah. where you have some group like dominating and murdering the other one. Yes, because it's a way of it's a way of separating yourself. Because you have to, if, if, you know, because if you had to reckon, you know, with it. Yeah. Um, then it would be just it would it would be too much. I it think would it, would, it could break. Yeah, that's right. It'd break people. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, with that, uh, what are we covering next time? So, so the, a lot of this was pretty heavy, you know, between talking about the nuclear bomb and Vietnam. Yeah. Next time we're going to be wildly changing gears, um, and we're going to be talking about the centuries-old conflict between religion and science. Oh, whether no. it's really a conflict <laughs> over and whether it's a conflict at all. Um, and we're going to talk about Stephen Jay Gould's excellent book from 1999, um, Rocks of Ages, nice. Science, Religion, and the Fullness of Life. Um, and he kind of comes up with a solution to that decades old problem of science versus religion. Right and we're going to kind of talk about the pros and cons of whether that was the right approach or not. We, uh, I, I guess, uh, in episode two, we covered Daniel Dennett's book, Breaking the Spell. Mm -hmm. Daniel Dennett just passed away a couple days ago. Yes, he did. He also put out a memoir earlier this year. Um, while I have, uh, you know, very vehement disagreements with Daniel Dennett, um, reading him was very formative to me. And, um, you know, it helped me become more interested in philosophy. 
Um, and I still think his position on free will is actually pretty good. Um, I still, I think that's the best stuff that he ever really worked on. Um, even if I don't like breaking the spell as a book very much, but yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Condolences to his family. Um, he was definitely one of the better people of the new atheist movement. Even if I have serious quibbles with him, yeah. um, he's not a complete moron and a racist like, um, Sam Harris says, and he's not a just out and out bigot moron like Richard Dawkins is. Right. Okay. Well, with all, uh, where can people find you? <laughs> so you can find me at justinclark.org. That's my website right down there. You can also fo follow, me, follow me on social media. I'm Justin Clark PH. PH stands for public history. Um, I'm mostly active on Instagram, but I do have a, I do have a threads account. I'm on TikTok. I'm on Blue Sky. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to post as much as possible, but I'm mostly active on Instagram. You can give me a follow there. I just passed over 1,100 followers on Instagram recently. Um, and right. so, yeah, I'm pretty happy with growing the, the community we've got there. So good stuff right on. for sure. And as I always say at the end, please consider becoming a patron. Uh, patron at patreon.com forward slash skeptical leftist. Um, you get all of these great shows here. You also get our pre and post games where we, where we talk about right. like more contemporary stuff. Um, and, uh, and you get kind of a bunch of other goodies too. And Corey works very, very hard and continues innovating and changing new ways of doing the show. And, uh, you can help support that work at Patreon. Right on. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Velkin999, Bemke Watches Buffy, Some Random Geek, and uh, Nonsequently for your comments and your participation in the channel. And uh, have a great night. Thanks. We'll see you next time. All right, folks. That's all for now. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Damian Marie at Hope, uh, Some Random Geek, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. And thank you to my new patrons. You can stay tuned for the list of patrons at the end to see your name listed. If you aren't a patron and want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. I also have a Substack where you can subscribe for free or you can donate per month. And lastly, you can get a paid subscription on Spotify that will give you the same access to bonus content and extra long episodes. If you can't contribute financially, then I would like on YouTube or a five-star rating on a, and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff. Or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical leftist. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. You can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. Also, stick around for a clip from this episode's post show chat. was a measles outbreak at an event oh jeez yeah and i'm like fucking measles like yeah. a, which we virtually eradicated in this country 20 years ago yeah like over 20 years ago we virtually eradicated measles and it's now coming back because of anti-vaxxers because all the i saw somebody on twitter say this like that was never actually just going to be limited to to the covid vaccine <clears throat> yep that was always going to be expanded to all vaccines all that rhetoric about them being eat bad and changing your dna and all that shit yeah yeah or like you know bill gates is putting wi-fi in you and like all yeah. this stuff
Rather than having like really good discussions of vaccine policy about how like, why is it that the COVID vaccine isn't owned by the federal government because we put in public dollars into it? Why is it being privatized? Why aren't we sharing the, the recipe with other companies to make it around the world? Why is there this like vaccine apartheid? Right. Um, 